Intel has finally pulled back the curtain and unveiled their next generation Arrow Lake processors, also named the Ultra 200 series for the desktop. Now, there's been a lot of discussion happening ever since the details surfaced, and I've seen a number of people cry doom and gloom, but I think there's more going on here that people are missing, and I don't think it'll be as bad as some folks are claiming. Let's discuss that in this video. Hey, if you enjoy content like this, drop a like, make sure to subscribe, and smash that bell so you never miss another video. Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here. Welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. Official details surrounding Intel's Arrow Lake S processors have finally emerged and I wanted to go through the slides and information from them. The initial reactions I have seen from people within the community hasn't been so positive. I've seen a lot of people basically call this Intel's Zen 5 and in a way I can see where they're coming from but I also think that there's more going on here and to me when I was going through the slides and the information about specs, power management, as well as the overhaul to overclocking functionality and when i look at a cpu like the ultra 9 285k this in my opinion will be a very tunable cpu or a very tunable architecture when the embargo lifts and depending on how reviewers set up their test benches along with configuring cpu settings i think we're going to be seeing some very interesting results the other thing i'll mention to you guys again because i had already mentioned this in the past when we were discussing leaks is that arrow leaks design and the objectives intel had with this architecture basically screams we prioritized HPC, data center, and enterprise clientele, which is the same strategy AMD positions and Phi for. That's just been the focus for a lot of the manufacturers in the semiconductor industry, and it looks like that isn't going to be changing for the foreseeable future. For Intel, especially given how much ground they've lost due to the delays and manufacturing issues they've had to face, it was crucial that they needed to retake some market share here. From a business perspective, this obviously makes more sense since that segment of the business tends to generate a lot more revenue compared to the general consumer segments. We'll talk more about that later on in the video, but first I wanted to go over the SKUs that Intel will be initially launching. So the initial lineup is pretty typical from what we see from Intel. We have an Ultra 9 SKU which is the equivalent of an i9. It's got the highest boost clocks, highest amount of cores, and cash. The 285k is going to launch at 590 US dollars, which is the same price as what the 4900k launched at. So that's good, the price has an increase and with this price point it actually comes in about $30 cheaper than AMD's flagship 9950X. Next, we have two Ultra 7 SKUs which are replacing the i7s, and the 265K and 265KF are basically the same model, but as you all know, the F models don't come with an iGPU or integrated graphics. What's noteworthy here is that the Ultra 7s will be slightly cheaper than what the 14700K and KF retailed for at $409 and $384 respectively. When I look at this pricing structure, the Ultra Ultra 7 looks like the best bang for the buck because the only thing that the Ultra 9 offers is 4 more e-cores, plus 200 megahertz on the boost clock, and slightly more cash. In gaming, the difference between the two would be a wash, and then the Ultra 9 would be offering like 10% more multi-core performance, and yet the difference in pricing is like 50%. So at 395 US, the Ultra 7 is giving consumers a really good value. I think it's the sweet spot. The next two SKUs are the Ultra 5s, replacing the i5s, and I don't think these are offering really good value for gamers. I think the Ultra 5 245K should have at most been $280, as it has 6 P cores and only 14 E cores. And and when it comes to power, all the SKUs have a base power rating of 125 watts and a turbo power rating of 250 watts, but I always find power figures to be arbitrary as power usage can vary depending on the workload or how threaded the game is. If you're wondering when they go on sale, they'll be hitting store shelves on October 24th, so in about a couple weeks from now, and I've seen retailers already post ads for pre-orders, which obviously I don't recommend anyone to do. With Arrow Lake's goals, this is what I was talking about, how Intel clearly is appeasing other segments of the customer base, like the data center or mobile customers, to keep up with the likes of Apple, Qualcomm, and AMD. As what they did with Arrow Lake is that they reduced power usage by a significant margin, deliver better multi-threading performance, while maintaining gaming performance. The language there is quite clear-cut to me, Arrow Lake wasn't ever going to be a gaming-focused architecture with massive gains in mind. Though, I can see why some folks would be disappointed 
disappointed in hearing that and find it underwhelming that there were barely any gains at all, so we basically just have a repeat of Zen 5. Here's the thing, over the past couple of years, I've been doing numerous benchmarks, tested out various games, with all sorts of different configurations, and I personally felt like these CPUs that we have now are already plenty fast, especially considering the fact that now we're starting to see this dynamic shift towards games being a lot more GPU bound, even at 1080p. I find considering how graphically demanding technologies like ray tracing, path tracing, global illumination, and more have become. This is why we still have people using Zen 3 or 10th generation Intel CPUs or even 9th gen, and they aren't really in any rush to upgrade because their CPUs still have plenty of grunt for these modern games. For Intel especially, finding a way to lower power consumption and heat was the right move. Therefore, if the 285K is able to trade blows with a 4900K, at much lower heat and power, I wouldn't necessarily call that a fail. We'll be circling back to gaming performance though later on. The Arrow Lake architecture design differs quite drastically from the previous generation, as now they're using a tiled-based design that works similarly to AMD's chiplet design. We're not going to be going over every single aspect of it, and I'm not going to be going over the iGPU stuff, but I did want to highlight some of the major noteworthy changes. Arrow Lake will be utilizing the new Line Cove P-Core, which provides a 9% uplift in IPC compared to the Raptor Lake P-Core. So Gen on gen, it's nothing drastic, I was at least hoping for 15% on average, especially since there is clock speed regression with the new node that they're using. On the other hand, it's the new Skymon E-Cores which have seen a massive uplift in IPC, and they also made some other changes where now the E-Cores have direct access to the cache, but these new E-Cores have been a major contributor to Arrow Lake's multi-threading performance, and why Intel was able to ditch hyper-threading, and that will show in multi-threading benchmarks. Here's an area where I was particularly particularly interested in. Intel has designed a new memory controller, and this new memory controller's official JDEC has been bumped up to 6400 mega transfers, up from 5600 mega transfers on Raptor Lake. So that's a pretty decent bump, but what I'm more interested in seeing is how this new memory controller performs with really high DDR5 frequency, because the problem with 13th and 14th gen was that on 4 DIMM boards, you'd at least be able to do like 7600 or maybe 7800 mega transfers, but that was really Really, really tough to dial in, but for most people, they would be settling in at around 6800 to 7200 mega transfers, as that was easily achievable with XMP or out of the box. Then, if you had a 2 DIM motherboard like the Asus Apex or the Gigabyte Tachyon, then you could push 800 mega transfers or beyond, and that did provide a nice performance boost when it came to gaming. With Arrow Lake, I'm optimistic that even on a 4 DIM motherboard, we should now be able to push north of 8000 mega transfers, maybe topping out at 9000 mega transfers with this new memory controller. Also, using the new QDIM modules and two DIM boards, that should allow users to push memory speeds to around 10,000 mega transfers, which would be an immense boost. Though we're still going to have to wait and see how this architecture scales with memory, and I've got a feeling it's going to really stretch its legs with those high memory speeds. I think this is something that Intel should have shown during their presentation, but I get why they didn't, as it would sort of be diving into that overclocking enthusiast territory, whereas clearly they had prioritized highlighting other aspects of the architecture like its efficiency, its AI NPU performance, and the iGPU. The other reason why I say I'm optimistic about this generation handling DDR5 memory better than the previous is because motherboard manufacturers have officially posted their product pages on their new Z890 motherboards, and the memory speeds that they're listing are pretty high even on 4 DIMM boards. Take the MSI Z890 Carbon for example, they list memory OC at 1 DPC single rank at 9200 plus, whereas on the Z790 Carbon Max Wi-Fi 2 that I also use in my test bench, they list it at 7800, though for me I was only able to stabilize it at 7600. Though keep in mind, manufacturers do have a tendency to be a bit egregious or overambitious with these memory speed listings, but that's still a huge gap between two generations. Another example I have is the Gigabyte Z890 Aorus Master, listing 9500 mega transfers OC. Now again, whether most people will be able to hit those frequencies still remains to be seen. And the other thing that I'll add on to this is that we're also going to be seeing more 2 DIM motherboards coming to the market. Whereas with the previous generation, we really only had the Apex Encore, the regular Apex on the Tachyon, and then the only other 2 DIM boards were ITX boards, which, you know, really weren't meant for memory OC. But for some reason, this generation, we have MSI coming back with their Unify X. We have ASRock coming with the special Tai Chi OC edition. We, of course, 
also have Asus and their Apex. I think Gigabyte's going to be making a Tachyon. So there's a lot more com competition. And it's interesting that, you know, mo motherboard manufacturers are introducing these new two DIMM boards with this generation. So I don't know. For me, that just gives me a sign. I feel like they wouldn't do that if the memory uh, tuning and the memory controller wasn't as good. Hey guys, editing Danny here. I just wanted to quickly jump in here and add a few important bits of information I found out later. So initially, as I was going over the slides, I wasn't aware that Intel actually did a stream and presentation where they did add some additional information that was presented in the slides. So I did add those clips in the video. So one of the things that Roger Chandler mentioned, which made me happy to hear, was that he said the sweet spot for Z890 will be 8,000 mega transfers. For enterprise users, we'll offer support for ECC memory, and our new memory controllers support the latest DIMM technologies like clocked unbuffered DIMM with overclocking support for 8,000 plus memory speeds. Now, as you may know, increasing memory frequency also increases the memory controller frequency. We think that DDR5-8000 might be a nice sweet spot, spot as the memory controller can stay in gear two, and you can get a lot of extra frequency out of the IMC and the memory. So that to me alludes to this being easily achievable even on four DIM motherboards. So he covers this in the overclocking and tunable section of the presentation, and I do urge you guys to check that out. I think with this tile design and the architecture, memory speeds will play a huge role in helping these CPUs boost performance and workloads like games because due to the new architecture there's more latency added and I can't remember where I heard this from but apparently Arrow Lake's cache clock runs a whole gigahertz lower than Arrow Lake at stock. This is why I think we haven't seen the full story yet with the performance that has been shown in their initial presentation and I think these CPUs will be really fun for enthusiasts to play around with and tune. They'll be very tunable CPUs and perhaps there's quite a bit of performance being left on the table. Maybe Intel is sandbagging here. I don't know. I think the boost clocks are fine but let's say you can get a 285k to sustain 5.7 all core on the P cores. The E cores are already good at 4.6, though I'd still like to know what their ceiling will be. Then let's say you push the cache to 4.5 or even 5 gigahertz, along with pairing it with memory running at 9200 mega transfers with optimized timings. I'm very curious to know how a setup like that would perform against a Max OC 14900K or 7800X3D. And this is why I didn't really bother going in depth with covering the gaming performance slides Intel included in their presentation. I mean, generally, I'm always recommending everyone to disregard the numbers anyways and wait for third party independent testing, but also the manufacturers will be cherry picking and set up their test benches in a way that either nerfs performance of the competing part or drastically favors the new one. With these benchmarks though I will give Intel kudos for also showing instances where they lose to the 14900k and also AMD CPUs but you can see from their footnotes that they were also using JDEC memory speeds so 6400 on Arrow Lake and 5600 on Raptor Lake and Zen 5 with stock power limits probably no undervolting the cache probably wasn't tuned so there's a lot of areas in which you can tune your system and from what it looks like they've just gone purely stock versus stock. And there are going to be reviewers who will be testing in the similar manner. Me personally, I like to showcase the full potential of the platform. So I usually like showing, you know, tuned or overclocked numbers as opposed to stock versus stock or out of the box. The other thing that Intel did was they enabled APO. Now, for those who are not familiar with APO, last year, Intel did release this application that essentially helps to optimize the scheduler for certain games, which can help boost performance. I haven't gotten around to testing it myself, probably will in the near future as they've added more games to the list. But from what I've seen from some of the limited testing out there, it does seem to boost performance in gaming significantly. With that said, I like how they did highlight the difference between the 285K and 14900K in gaming tests when it came to power and thermals, where in some scenarios, the 285K reduced system power by up to 165 watts. That was in Warhammer Space Marine 2, which is a new game, and the Geomean average was 73 watts, which is decent, and in terms of temps, according to the way Intel had their test bench set up, they were seeing double digit drops up to 17 degrees Celsius in some cases, and on average, it ran about 13 degrees cooler, so that's good news. With Arrow Lake, Intel will also be introducing their third generation thread director. With hybrid architectures that utilize large cores and efficient cores, you have to ensure the software and thread management is properly handled by the operating system, and that is extremely crucial for performance, especially for games. So they've made some changes here, and that hopefully mitigates some of the weird annoyances people had with programs not properly adapting to the different cores. Sometimes games would opt to use E cores instead of P cores, drastically hurting performance. So 
hopefully this fixes all of that. Another thing that I wanted to touch upon was the Z890 platform, and more specifically, I wanted to talk about platform longevity. Intel in their presentation made no mention or alluded to there being another generation of CPUs that would come to Z890 after Arrow Lake. Apparently, there were rumors of a Arrow Lake refresh that got cancelled, but aside from that, there really isn't anything else on the table as far as we know. And that would be quite disappointing if there really is only one generation of CPUs for this platform, and not at least two, which is what we've been accustomed to. Tim from Hardware Unboxed said he reached out and got a no comment as a reply from Intel, which isn't really an answer, but it does also imply that they don't have anything else to offer besides this generation. Now, some people may not really care about this, especially if you're someone who keeps the same hardware and rides it for like four to five years, which is an approach I typically recommend anyways, considering the incremental upgrades that we get. But it's nice to know that maybe you can breathe some extra life into a system with a simple CPU upgrade. I'm still using my X370 AM4 motherboard from 2017 in my OLED rig which has a 5800X3D. That board started off with a Ryzen 7 1800X, so it was really nice to be able to do that without having to change anything else. Therefore, I'm hoping at the very least there is one other generation coming after Arrow Lake. Aside from that though, there's not much else I really wanted to talk about. I know I skipped over the whole AI stuff and workstation performance slides, and from what I can tell, it's going to do really well there, but... I know most of my audience is primarily interested in the gaming aspect of the CPU. For now, we're going to have to wait until the CPUs hit store shelves, and I can get my hands on one to do some testing for you guys. As for now, that's going to be wrapping it up for this one, and we'll be touching base in the next video. If you guys found this video to be informative and entertaining, then leave a like. Let me know your thoughts and comments down below. Be sure to check out the video description for cool links and ways to support the channel, such as using my Amazon affiliate link. And if you're interested in seeing more content like this, then consider subscribing, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching, take care and I'll see you in the next one.